Well, good morning, everybody. I think we'll start now. Welcome to another um, Guidelines International Network uh, ANZ meeting. My name is Garant Duggan, and I'll be hosting this webinar with my colleague Alice Downing from NHMRC. I'd like to extend a special thank you to Daniel Pollock and the team at Joanna Briggs Institute uh, for making all of this happen today. It's very much appreciated. Just a few housekeeping issues. Um, you will all be joining on listen-only mode. We'd love you to interact via the chat functionality and you're able to ask questions in the Q&A functionality. So please use that for specific questions. For those of you that love to tweet and make Elon Musk richer, these are the things that you need to know. So please, we'd love you to tweet throughout the webinar. Before we start today, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land from which we are speaking to you today. For the speakers today, it is the lands of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We wish to pay our respects to elders both past and present and to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining the webinar today. What we'd like to do today is to cover four broad areas um, regarding the role of NHMRC and guidelines. I'd like to spend a bit of time uh, discussing what NHMRC is, what we do, then to go into some detail about the NHMRC approval of third party guidelines, and then to talk about what uh, next steps we're uh, undertaking at the moment. So what is NHMRC? Well, it's very old for a start. Uh, NHMRC is the main statutory authority of the Australian government responsible for medical research. There are, of course, lots of other organisations that fund and have research policy uh, responsibilities at the moment, but NHMRC is the oldest. It was established in 1936 um, in response to a Royal Commission that uh, occurred in 1926 um, which was established to encourage and develop research work in Australia um, in response to concerns that Australia was falling behind the rest of the world in medical research. We are governed by our own Act of Parliament um, and we are independent. We're the sixth largest uh, medical research funding organisation in the world, apparently and we fund uh, across 10 main grant schemes. And last year, I think we committed uh, more than a billion dollars in new funding. In addition, we also um, administer a large number of uh, medical research future fund grant programs and grant programs run in conjunction with other jurisdictions like the European Union. So everybody knows about our grants role, and probably many of you here today are uh, seeking or have already got uh, an HMRC grants. I think less is known about the other areas of work that we do that we consider to be equally important. Um, embryo licensing, research ethics, research translation, indigenous health, and of course, guidelines, which we're talking about today. This slide shows the four key functions that have been uh, set out for NHMRC in the NHMRC Act. First is to raise the standard of individual and public health throughout Australia. The second, which encompasses the guideline function, is to foster development of consistent health standards between states and territories. And then obviously to uh, foster medical research and training in public health throughout Australia and foster consideration of ethical issues, which incorporates uh, some animal welfare issues as well. So I want to take you back in time to 1937. Some of you have seen this slide already. Um, this is the first meeting of NHMRC, which was held in Hobart. Uh, as you can see around the table, there are 19 men and not a single woman. Um, in Australia in those days, the key health issues were uh, very poor pregnancy outcomes, venereal disease, malnutrition and tuberculosis, which was in epidemic proportions. This slide illustrates some of the issues that 
the NHMRC Council um, considered at that first meeting. And I think they're remarkably precedent. And what happens, I think, is that everything old is now new again. So encouraging medical students to take up a career in research, that was the uh, recommendation of the Royal Commission. The Mayor of Darlinghurst um, asked NHMRC's advice for Mar Barnes's miracle cure for tuberculosis, uh, which council said wasn't evidence-based. Um, there was concern about animal to human transmission of disease, and in those days it was bovine TV. There was a remarkable um, discussion about the economic impact of quarantining people for tuberculosis, and particularly the role of breadwinners and how they could be adequately um, protected and protecting other people. And the final recommendation uh, was that the Commonwealth and state governments institute uh, a definitive system of public health education. If we fast forward to 2022, um, you can see that uh, there are more women. There are actually 13 women and 11 men in NHMRC Council, not all of them are shown. And 83 years later, some of these issues are still there. So in, last year, um, NHMRC released the Clinician Researcher Pathways Report, um, looking at ways to encourage uh, clinicians to take a career in research, particularly Indigenous clinicians, and also helping allied health uh, midwives and nursing uh, clinician researchers who have particular problems at the moment. Uh, the miracle cure for tuberculosis has been replaced by ivermectin. Uh, human to, so animal to human transmission of disease still exists, of course, Japanese encephalitis and Hendra virus. And again, we're focusing on the economic aspects of COVID quarantine orders, uh, restricting people from work and testing. And public health campaigns are now pretty much uh, firmly established as the centerpiece of all public health campaigns in Australia. So hopefully that's given you an introduction of what NHMRC is. I'm now going to hand over to Alice to tell you what NHMRC does. Thanks very much, Garrett. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what NHMRC um, does. So um, NHMRC um, does a lot of different things. Um, among those things, we uh, develop and issue guidelines. So as you can see on the screen there, um, the guidelines that we issue cover a lot of different topics ranging from environmental health, health and research ethics, um, clinical practice and public health. Um, and those guidelines contain advice on everything from what to feed your infants to um, what constitutes um, safe drinking water. <clears throat> so NHMRC also um, set Australian guidelines standards. So um, the 2016 guideline standard was developed um, to align with international best practice in guideline development and also was based on international uh, consensus at the time. So this standard is something that can be used by all guideline developers, uh, whether it's in clinical practice or public or environmental health. Um, and this is something that we would really consider to be the minimum standard for um, a guideline document. So I think if you all take one thing from this webinar, I'd really encourage you to use um, and at least be aware of this guideline standard. Um, and that's even if you choose not to consider seeking uh, NHMRC approval of your guideline. Uh, NHMRC is also a source of trusted advice. So um, guidelines for guidelines is something that I think probably a lot of people here are very familiar with. Um, and this is what we call the how to do it side of things. So um, this handbook was created um, a few years ago, really to help guideline developers produce um, great high quality guidelines um, that meet the 2016 guideline standard um, that I spoke about on that previous slide. Um, and this handbook was actually created by the guideline development community in Australia. So I'm sure we've got 
uh, a few people here today um, that have contributed to particular modules. So thank you very much for everyone um, that's contributed to this really valuable uh, resource that we can now share. <coughs> Um, so NHMRC was previously also a guideline promoter. So um, some of you would be very familiar with the clinical practice guidelines portal, um, which was, um, it was created back in 2006 in response to a bit of a problem that was occurring uh, in guidelines world. And that was that um, guidelines were being duplicate, duplicated and um, guidelines were being published um, and promoted in lots of different places. So the portal was really created as a bit of a one-stop shop uh, for guidelines in Australia. Um, and now, you know, it's 2022, uh, people know where to find guidelines and know um, what to look for in a quality guideline. So the portal's really served its purpose now and it was actually decommissioned uh, last month. So um, NHMRC approval is definitely still the best identifier of a quality guideline. Um, but if you're looking for an alternative or um, an, an alternative option to the portal, um, we're directing people over to the fabulous GIN guideline library. Um, and that's something that Garrett um, actually did quite a lot of work with GIN on um, to create. So, that is the new best option in town. Um, and in the future, we're going to be encouraging any NHMRC approved guidelines to add their guideline onto the GIN library. Um, so it is available um, and can be promoted um, through that library instead. <clears throat> um, so this slide has, um, some text from an NHMRC approved guideline. And this is what we would consider, um, it's basically some standard text um, that we ask a guideline developer to include on the Verso page of their guideline or on their uh, web platform version of their guideline. Um, and this is basically what we're gonna be focusing on today. This is basically the crux of what we do in this um, clinical guidelines team. So I'll just go through a few of these highlighted points uh, just quickly. Um, the NHMRC CEO um, is presented with advice from a range of different areas within the agency, but um, ultimately the decision whether or not to approve a guideline is her decision. Um, and that um, comes under a very specific part of the NHMRC Act, um, which gives the CEO the power to approve a guideline that's developed by a third party. So in the last few years, um, as guidelines have gotten a little bit more complicated and often um, are quite a long document, um, NHMRC moved to approve just the recommendations contained in guidelines. So previously we approved um, the guideline document as a whole, um, but council decided it was appropriate to move just to approve recommendations only. So that approval indicates that the NHMRC standard for guidelines has been met and that is valid for a period of five years. So the five-year approval period is something uh, that's been discussed a lot in council meetings over the last couple of years. And this is something um, that we're really considering at the moment, whether this is appropriate or not, or if it needs to be changed. <coughs> okay, so... Um, now I'm going to hand over to our first fabulous guest, uh, Dr. Roz Lethbridge. Um, Roz is from Phoenix, Australia, and Phoenix originally approached us um, back in 2016 about approval of the Australian guidelines for the prevention and treatment of acute stress disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and complex PTSD. Um, and since the original approval, um, Phoenix actually came back to us 
um, to uh, approve an update of the guideline back in 2020. So Roz has actually experienced our wonderful approval program twice. So she is a wealth of knowledge. Um, and I'm going to pose two questions to Roz and then I'll flick over to you. So Roz, if you could tell us um, why did you approach NHMRC for approval um, and then come back and seek approval for the updated guideline? And then second question is, um, is the NHMRC process more than what you would have done? So take it away, Roz. Thanks very much, um, Alice, and thanks to Alice and um, Garrett for inviting me to speak here today. Um, Alice, we also um, came back to you at the end of last year, so 2021, with a small update um, because we've adopted the living guideline um, context like a number of other developers, I think. Um, so our guideline provides recommendations that um, promote recovery following trauma, as well as effective treatment options for those who develop mental health symptoms after a traumatic event. So as you mentioned, this is pretty much our third iteration of the guideline. And um, we had previously approached you for um, approval for the previous iterations. So basically we view that approval as the final quality tick in the development process. Um, it indicates to our stakeholders that the guidelines are of a rigorous standard and that they're also the best practice recommendations for the use of health professionals in Australia. We promote the NHMRC approval as an indicator that our guideline represents both the current knowledge and the best treatment practice for clinicians and for other users. It's possible that that approval contributes to their international weight as well. Um, for example, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies has just recently requested to adopt our guideline as the standard as opposed to developing their own as they have done in the past. Now, um, People here would likely be aware that the um, approval process um, requires consultation with key professional and consumer organisations that would be involved with or affected by the implementation of the um, clinical recommendations that are contained within our guideline. So it's the endorsement of the guidelines by those organisations. Um, in our case, that's the, um, the College of Psychiatrists, the College of General Practitioners and the Australian Psychological Society provides the best avenue of dissemination and take up of the current evidence-based recommendations. Um, so while each of those peak um, organisations have their own endorsement procedures, um, when we follow the N NHMRC approval process, that means that during public consultation, those organisations have the opportunity to engage with and provide feedback on the guideline content. Um, that's a real advantage for us um, because we find that all peak bodies do circulate the draft guideline to their members and we do get comprehensive feedback and we're able to provide written responses to every stakeholder um, who provides us any provides us some um, with information in a submission. And I guess the point that I'm making there is that it's likely that that consultation process um, um, required for NHMRC approval actually contributes to the subsequent endorsement of the guideline by each of those peak organisations. And that endorsement adds to the guidelines weight as being trustworthy, which is obviously really important for us, basically is the current treatment Bible for practitioners and thereby increases, <coughs> excuse me, the reach and the take up of the guideline. Um, so Alice, your second question was whether that um, approval process is more than we would have done. Um, so I checked in with my team um, prior to this webinar and we agreed that we would have followed most of the requirements set out by NHMRC. In fact, for me as project manager at the time, it was very useful to have those requirements clearly articulated so we could tick them off as we traveled through the development process. Um, there were a number of firsts um, for us with the current iteration of the PTSD treatment guideline. Um, in particular, as I mentioned before, it was our first time developing a living guideline um, where the recommendations are updated as new evidence becomes available. Um, to, uh, to facilitate that process, we used the Magic App platform, and that was a whole new way for us um, in terms of entering the evidence and presenting the recommendations. And it was really useful to receive NHMRC guidance in that context as to how other guideline developers were navigating both Magic App and also how to seek approval when recommendations were being updated more frequently than had historically been the case. So to keep that process moving, um, 
some development requirements needed modification. And again, again, that um, NHMRC guidance was invaluable for us as developers there. Um, but what wouldn't we have done? Um, perhaps we wouldn't have followed the external expert review process. Um, that's really quite um, time consuming for us in terms of putting um, more time into the um, approval process. We had a broad range of experts in our guideline development group and we might have considered their input and the subsequent um, public consultation feedback that we received to be sufficient. Um, we were also required as part of the approval process to produce a dissemination plan. And that felt a little pie in the sky for us at the time as we weren't funded for guideline dissemination. So providing the plan seemed um, a little optimistic as we weren't sure how we could implement it. Um, however, this year, the Department of Health did provide us with funding to increase the reach of the guideline. Um, and it was really helpful to have previously considered dissemination and pull out that plan rather than having it um, decay on the shelf, metaphorically speaking. Um, so finally, on that topic of reach, um, this year, um, in addition to the ongoing surveying of the literature, we're engaged in activities to, engage, um, to increase stakeholder engagement and awareness of the PTSD guideline. And you'll see um, in this slide that's in front of you, there's a survey linked to a very short survey on our guideline. Um, and I'll also add that link into the chat. Um, anyone watching, anyone here today, um, any responses to that survey would be greatly appreciated. Thank you and thanks for your time. Wonderful. Thanks for ex um, sharing your experience uh, with the approval program, Roz. So, um, now I'm going to hand back over to Geraint, who's going to run through the approval process in a bit more detail. So um, hopefully what Ros has said and what I'm about to say will uh, make, make you have a different opinion than Groucho Marx. You know, join our club and these are the reasons why you should join our club. Just to clarify um, what NHMRC means by approval in, in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And our tagline for approval is that uh, NHMRC approval indicates to users that a guideline is of high quality, is based on the best available scientific evidence and has been developed to rigorous standards. They're recognized in Australia and internationally as representing current knowledge and best health practice. That's the aim. So what is an HMRC approval? How do you get there? I'm going to go through some steps just to briefly describe um, the process. Um, obviously, this is just a, a highly summarized version and um, I particularly will come back to point one uh, after this section. So the first step is that you will um, register a guideline on a web form, which um, triggers a, a warning within an HMRC that somebody would like to start a new guideline through our process. At this stage, we uh, undertake a basic assessment of the topic and we do some due diligence of the guideline developer to make sure that this wasn't just an accident or a brain fart, that somebody actually wants to work with us to develop a guideline. Interestingly, around this time, about 30% of guideline are, are rejected. They are clearly not, um, not what we're after or what they're after. Um, the exclusions are based on some due diligence criteria like um, undeclared industry funding, um, people being clearly under-resourced to take on a guideline development project. Um, sometimes people uh, overseas will register a guideline by mistake. Um, and also registering a guideline that's intended for a very specific geographical use, and I'll come back to that later on. Once uh, a guideline has been, uh, a request has been registered with us, um, we have an initial meeting with the guideline development team and just go through a, a very basic outline of what, what's involved and get a sense that um, both parties know what they're doing. And particularly, we want people to understand uh, the importance of having a methodological basis and understanding grade and having you know, the correct staffing and so on. Once that step has, got, has been uh, completed, we then write to our CEO asking for formal agreement to take this guideline onto our program. It's important to point out that um, 
NHMRC approval does actually incur a cost to NHMRC, uh, both for contractors and also staff time. So it's important that we make sure that our, our resources are used very carefully. So the next stage, uh, we have a startup meeting with the guideline developers, and then in some ways they're left to develop the guideline as they wish. Um, we refer them to the NHMRC's procedures and requirements, and this is the very specific what to do document um, that is currently uh, planned for review. Um, but it has two different components. The first is the procedures, which is basically uh, the agreement between NHMRC and the developer, who does what, when they do it, and what reasonable expectation they should have about timing. The requirements are the very specific uh, elements that a guideline must contain in order to be NHMRC approved. In addition, we expect guideline developers to use guidelines for guidelines, which is the how to do it. This is a living document that really is distillation of all guideline development experience in Australia, as far as we have been able to work with the community to get this put together. We strongly encourage anybody considering NHMRC approval to read guidelines for guidelines at the very beginning of the process, particularly the area around planning, uh, which helps you to understand the scope and the scale of work involved. So steps two and three, the guideline developers are working away in the background. We will ask for progress reports. Really important to understand that NHMRC cannot offer any guideline development advice, particularly methodological advice, during this period. This is something NHMRC did in the past, um, and for 10 years or more now, we have not done this. I'm not a methodologist, nor is Alice, no methodologist on our team. Like you, we, we buy expertise through contract when we need it. Um, so please make sure that you have uh, adequate resources in this area to, to develop your guideline, along with all the other ones that we've outlined in Guidelines for Guidelines. Around 10% of guideline developers don't get further than this point. They either lose momentum, lose key staff, um, viruses come along and disrupt everything. Um, so, the, and there's no disgrace in doing that. I mean, sub guidelines just do not proceed. We understand that. As Roz mentioned before, public consultation is a key step. It's actually a step that's outlined in our legislation and also in the regulations that accompany them. Um, the public consultation draft, uh, the developer liaises with NHMRC and it's sent out for consultation for a minimum of 30 days. We, we stress the minimum because we have been advised by many organizations that they cannot marshal an adequate response to a complex guideline within 30 days. So we strongly encourage developers to think about a longer consultation period if possible, particularly when it covers a time like Christmas or Easter. NHMRC uh, assists with public consultation in that we uh, advise which areas of government to target and also to send a public consultation draft to the um, heads of each state and territory health department. They are absolutely instrumental in the success of guidelines in Australia for implementation. Um, they have a wealth of knowledge in things that nobody else would know. We also invite our council members in their individual capacities to uh, take part in public consultation too. We expect that the comments that are harvested during public consultation are given due regard. Um, so we would expect uh, documentation that all the comments have been read, understood, and clearly not every public consultation comment requires a change to the guideline. Um, and it's important to understand that some guidelines will have a relatively modest amount of people providing comment. Um, I think the lowest we've seen is seven. But if your guideline includes something that's contentious like vaccination policy, you would expect a, a very, very large number of um, consultation comments. So setting your scope is really important and that's something that guidelines for guidelines will help you to do.
once the public consultation is over, you submit your guideline to us as a post public consultation draft. And HMRC commissions independent methodological review to make sure that it meets our standards and that uh, grade has been properly applied. And as Ross pointed out, uh, a fairly contentious step, we, we invite experts to comment on the guideline. This was at the request of our council. And the fear is that some highly opinionated expert would overturn an evidence-based process. And this is not the intent. The experts are actually asked to answer very specific questions, just three of them. Uh, and sometimes they can add some quite rich and valuable context to guidelines and reassure our council members. NHMRC will then send the reviewer comments to the developer for consideration um, with instructions about how we would expect you to address those comments. And then a final uh, guideline, a draft guideline is sent back to NHMRC and this is where the uh, process for approval starts. So uh, staff at NHMRC brief council members um, before a meeting, the meetings are held three times a year and we line everything up and we would not send a guideline to our council uh, meeting unless we had a reasonable expectation that it was going to be successful. NHMRC Council makes a recommendation to the CEO, so it's important to point out that it's not actually NHMRC Council that approves it, they, they refer to the CEO who takes their advice. Um, NHMRC Council is uh, comprised of a lot of experts, but it's unlikely that that will contain expertise in the specific clinical topic. So they have requested, in most cases, that a guideline representative will be attending the meeting to answer questions. Uh, and they also take note of the expert reviews. Then the CEO will approve guideline recommendations on the advice of council. Council may advise to approve the rec uh, to approve a guideline as it is. They may suggest minor changes, um, or they may occasionally. Uh, in fact, we've only seen this once for a particularly egregious breach of conflict of interest policy. Uh, they, they may recommend that the guideline is not approved. But in, in the vast majority of cases, um, the CEO would be advised to approve the recommendations. So just a, a quick note on the word recommendations here. So as Alice has pointed out before, um, although we require all information relating to the guideline development process to be submitted, including administration, administrative reports, technical reports, and so on, in the end, the recommendations are the key uh, currency of a guideline. The reason we do this is we found in the past that people, once the guideline was in use, people noticed typos, errors, graphs were missing, references that were missing. And at the time, they had to come back to NHMRC for reapproval of changes, which was clearly a, uh, not, not the intention. So now we require um, any changes to the wording of recommendations only to come back to NHMRC. Um, in most cases, that would also involve, involve going back to public consultation, although there is a mechanism to avoid that for minor wording changes. Um, we encourage people to update their guidelines. It's absolutely essential that people keep their guidelines current for good governance, good clinical practice. And more and more of our work is now involved in trying to harmonize some of the learnings from living guidelines with our approval process. So just a quick note about registering a guideline if you've been tempted and you're about to do it. Um, first thing is the title, it says before you begin. So this whole process is designed to take somebody with us uh, through guideline development. We will not approve a guideline that has already been developed or is substantially been developed. This is a partnership from the very beginning. Second thing to point out is that the web form does not have an auto save function and we require a lot of information. So please have that information ready before you begin. We want to know four broad things. Um, who will fund your guideline? We don't approve guidelines funded by industry. Um, if you have no funding source, um, we understand that some funders, potential funders, 
require a guideline to be registered first. That's fine, but we will not take you through the approval process until we know that you have a secure um, non-conflicted funding source. We know that nobody develops a guideline just for fun, that there is actually a really solid clinical reason for doing it. But we do ask that you um, translate that into the um, into an argument, a persuasive argument about why this guideline should be on our program, because it is a very crowded program at the moment. So please discuss burden of disease, um, clinical relevance, and also what a step that a lot of people miss is why is a guideline needed, not standards and not something else? What is it specifically about a guideline that you think will make a difference to Australia? We ask that you intend that your guideline is used for national use, so it's an Australia-wide guideline. We acknowledge that states and territories have really good guideline programs, you know, evidence-based, solid pro um, programs. We're, we're certainly not disputing their quality. And we know, too, that some of the specialist hospitals have guideline programs as well. But at the moment, we are only going to approve guidelines that are intended for national use. And because in the past we have um, been very aware of uh, competition within the guideline space, we ask that uh, if there is a duplicate guideline in circulation that is evidence-based, that you make a case about why another guideline is needed, why, why we should um, approve uh, another guideline. So the link to the registration form is there, and please feel free to discuss with us beforehand if you are thinking about registering a guideline, we'd be more than happy to talk to you. Okay, and now I'm going to hand over to Alice for the final part, what now and what next. Thanks, Garrett. So now I just want to go through a few more things. Um, this slide, I think, is quite an interesting slide because um, it's got a few of the titles of guidelines that we've approved um, in the past couple of years. Um, and I wanted to pull out these few guidelines because I think it's really important to acknowledge that NHMRC, um, we don't just approve what, what we sort of consider the big guidelines. So um, we do consider for approval lots of different guideline topics, um, whether it's a smaller scale guideline, um, a more rare topic, um, the scope could be um, children only, or it might be adult populations. Um, some of these guidelines were approved, um, sorry, developed through international partnerships. Um, and we do have guidelines that have been um, adapted for um, Australian use um, that have been approved. So I think the key message with this slide is that um, if you think your guideline might be um, sort of outside of what NHMRC approval um, criteria might be, I think really reconsider that because we do approve um, a real range of topics um, and we do approve guidelines that are developed through different methods, um, international collabs or um, adaptations. So um, please consider seeking approval um, if that might be you. Um, okay, now I'd like to introduce Dr. Emily Reeve. Um, Emily is now at Monash University, um, but Emily was over at the University of Sydney uh, when she approached us uh, back in 2016. Um, and that was about the evidence-based clinical practice guideline for deprescribing cholinesterase inhibitors and memantine. Um, and that guideline was approved in 2017. So um, Emily, I'll pose two questions to you and then I'll hand over. Um, so your first question is, can you tell us about your experience with the approval program? And the second question is, what has happened to your guidelines since approval? Um, and do you feel that approval was beneficial for the implementation process? Yeah, thank you, Alice. Um, so I guess um, one, one point to mention maybe before I get into some of the details, um, as you mentioned before, some of the guidelines are international, ours was, we were particularly um, collaborating with a group from Canada and they had developed four deprescribing specific guidelines for four different drug classes. 
those of you who aren't familiar with the term, deprescribing is actually when and how we get people off drugs, so stopping drugs rather than starting them. Um, so I ended up collaborating with them for this guideline and they were already following a very robust method, but because we were developing it for Australia as well, um, we did want to um, consider having approval from NHMRC and the experience of, of the process with NHMRC was actually really fantastic. Um, as you said, you don't give methodological advice, but you the advice anytime I kind of had a question, it was a really quick response. Um, I even remember talking to Grant way back when we first started. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, there was a little bit more work, maybe just kind of making sure that we were ticking all those pros, all those different things, because we'd hate to get to the end and realize we'd missed something. Um, but overall, it was a really positive experience. Um, in terms of what has happened since approval, um, as I mentioned, there were four previous guidelines developed in Canada, and we did really um, benefit from the momentum and the, um, I guess, reputation that they'd already um, begun to establish. Um, we did publish the summary in the Medical Journal of Australia, which has actually been really highly cited. Um, we've had some Australian and international dissemination and implementation activities. Um, just as an example, uh, the web page that we um, hosted it on, it got over 8,000 views in the first year and a half. That's also been references, referenced and incorporated into a number of reference textbooks, including the RACGP Aged Care Clinical Guide, their silver book, uh, as well as Canadian resources, RX Files, and the Canadian Pharmacy Association Drug Resource. We've also had some requests for translations, particularly of the two-page algorithm that we developed to go with the full guidelines. So I believe there's a Finnish and a Spanish translation out there now. Um, we've also been doing some, I guess, implementation activities or activities to, su to support implementation. Some of these have taken a bit longer um, than we planned, but um, this guideline, as well as the four previous ones, were developed into an app. And we actually did some analysis and, and wrote up about that as well. And at one point in time after we launched it, there were over 900 active users a quarter internationally. We've also developed a patient decision aid, um, which worked really well because we already had the evidence from the guideline. We finished that, but we haven't published it yet, as well as doing a study. We've just finished about um, co-designing how a guideline like this would be implemented in hospital. I do think that NHMRC approval was really beneficial for us, although it's perhaps hard to quantify um, exactly how much impact it has. Because this was the first evidence-based deprescribing guideline in Australia, um, and because deprescribing maybe isn't as familiar to everybody and previous research kind of, you know, people think it's not as evidence-based, you know, which is that there's not as much evidence, but it still can be evidence-based. Um, or that maybe it's not as important as prescribing. So for us, getting that NHMRC approval really kind of showed that deprescribing guidelines can be developed to those and held to those same robust standards as prescribing guidelines. Um, and I think this in turn then gave credibility to the previous four guidelines that have been developed overseas as well. Um, and I'll stop there, thanks. Wonderful. Thanks so much for sharing your experience, Emily, and um, highlighting uh, your international collaboration experience as well. So um, what now and what next? Um, we think that the time's come to really consider some of the changes in guideline development methods. Um, we know, as many of you would, that guidelines are being updated far more regularly. Um, and we're seeing really uh, rapid processing of evidence now. So some good examples of that happening is the, uh, the stroke guidelines and the um, national COVID-19 guidelines. So as I mentioned before, um, we are really considering that five-year approval period. Um, and I um, saw that there's a question that um, we'll answer at the end um, about what's happening with that uh, review. Um, 
but that's something that we would all um, be considering in the scheme of living guidelines and also um, in the scheme of a regular um, guideline update. So <clears throat> really with those things in mind, we We've um, started the process of reviewing our procedures and requirements, um, and that's that document, um, which is the what to do side of things um, for the NHMRC approval program. So our um, current procedures and requirements will definitely remain in place until any new um, guideline, um, sorry, guidance is released. Um, and in the meantime, during the review process, um, we are really going to be engaging with the sector at lots of points in the process. Um, we are planning to conduct some of those consultations through GIN. So um, please look out for any emails through GIN, um, providing opportunities to um, give feedback or um, work with us on this process. Um, and we are also planning to put out a um, discussion paper that will be asking for comments. So the aim of this process really will be um, to simplify those procedures and requirements. So um, we want to make sure that we create the best model and um, make it um, easier for the developers um, in terms of the what to do um, side of the approval program. So with that being said, Sorry, <clears throat> um, please um, really consider seeking approval. Um, I hope that Garrett and I have uh, hopefully whetted your appetite and perhaps persuaded you to pursue approval. Um, if you are in the early stages of developing a guideline or you think that your guideline might um, fit the criteria for the program, um, please do approach us. If you have any questions, do send us an email. We're always happy to um, have an informal chat um, if you're considering approval. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, I hope um, we have answered all your questions. If not, um, we've got a few minutes now um, where we'll take any questions. Um, but Garrett, um, did you want to answer that question that Rachel posed about the uh, five year, the review of the five year approval uh, time? I think I have answered it um, in the text, but I'm such a, um, a near fight when it comes to <laughs> live Q&A, so I'll answer it verbally as well. Um, I mean, that's one of the things we're really keen to consult with. I mean, we, we've had lots of um, suggestions um, first of all, to say that the five-year approval program is not a uh, five-year approval is not really evidence-based. Uh, it was a sort of pragmatic decision, um, and we've uh, certainly heard proposals that developers should be encouraged to nominate um, the duration of a particular recommendation's life to something that's quite attractive. Um, and again, one of the challenges is building that into the approval program to make sure that recommendations that are circulating um, are safe. I mean, one of the things that we, we do struggle with is that the governance of guidelines in Australia um, is quite challenging. And a lot of old guidelines and old recommendations are still in circulation um, in areas like chronic fatigue syndrome, for instance, which is, you know, it's causing a lot of problems where recommendations that are 20 years old are still being used and circulated. Um, so we plan to put out a discussion paper with some of the broad issues that, that we would like people's views on. And we're really keen to work with developers to come up with something that's workable, sustainable, safe, um, and ethical. I think there was another question about the number of guidelines seeking approval over the last few years. Um, I think the number of new guidelines has been relatively stable, but the number of living guidelines or rapidly updated guidelines has uh, increased substantially, um, notwithstanding the stroke guidelines, which are sort of leading the pack. Thanks, Kelvin. Um, and we are we do have a bottleneck in our council meets three times a year and has um, basically half day set aside for guideline work. And that includes guidelines developed by NHMRC in, in areas like public health. Um, so, you know, while we encourage people to um, 
to get their guidelines approved, it, it is quite a logistical challenge. And also to acknowledge that COVID has absolutely uh, annihilated the sort of certainty that, that we've hoped for with guideline programs. Many, many people have really struggled. They've been pulled off uh, their guideline projects to do clinical work and to do other work. So we hope things will settle down this year. Okay, um, any other questions? Okay, we've just got one other question about how we select expert reviewers for the guidelines and who determines the responses to their recommendations. So I'm happy to start with that one, um, Garrett, and then I'll just make sure you don't want to add anything. Um, we, uh, NHMRC goes through a process of selecting the expert reviewers and this is something that is separate to any of the experts that are involved in the guidelines so um, we ask developers to provide us with some suggested um, experts that have been outside of their development process um, <clears throat> that would be um, appropriate people to comment on the content of the guidelines and the recommendations um, we often approach um, quite a few people because obviously, um, you know, if, if an expert is at the top of their field, they're quite busy as all guideline development people are. Um, and we uh, often also um, ask for experts um, in the field that are outside of Australia. So um, for guidelines in the past, um, we've approached the Canadian expert in the field or, you know, the Swedish expert in whatever field it may be. Um, and we pose three questions to them um, and ask them um, to provide us with um, their opinion on the recommendations contained within that guideline. Um, then those comments are de-identified and provided back to the guideline developer. Um, and as Garrett touched on, um, as part of the approval process, you know, whether it's public consultation comments or the expert review comments, um, we ask the developers to consider what the comments are saying. Um, we don't necessarily expect that um, a change to a recommendation is made based on an expert review comment, um, unless it was something significant, like the example Garrett used, um, if it was, um, uh, for example, you know, um, a new piece of evidence has been released um, and that um, requires a, a change to that recommendation. Um, Garrett, did you want to add anything? Yeah, so uh, look, there's, there's quite a lot more to uh, expert review. So um, we select them on the basis that we would select uh, people for a, a typical peer review process. That, that's the bottom line. We ask developers to nominate um, half the cohort, and then we try and match that with another uh, group. Um, what we what, what, what council have challenged us with finding out is, are the Australian, Australian guidelines substantially different to any other international guidelines? And if so, why? And that's a reasonable question for them to ask. But one of the, one of the intended side effects of asking expert reviewers for their views is that it actually promotes Australian guidelines overseas. So I won't embarrass the developer because I think they're on the call today, but we've had responses from one developer who said, this guideline sets the standard for the way guidelines in this particular condition should be approached and addressed, and we will be following that in future. So that's a good, healthy response. Um, we are very aware that some uh, expert reviewers go outside their lane and start to offer unsolicited opinions, and that's their prerogative, but we really focus on the questions. Are the guidelines broadly compatible with guidelines internationally, current guidelines internationally in other, used in other countries? If not, why not? We know that people tend to um, bring up current references that weren't included in the guideline, and we know that that's out of scope. We know that experts are very keen on promoting their own um, publications as well. That's just a side effect of peer review. Um, but it, it is something that is built into the mix. And we, we just ask, um, you know, we understand that there are concerns and we are very, very aware of those and we try to mitigate those. 
<clears throat> okay, so one question from Kelvin. Um, any comments on full public disclosures of comments or responses in consultation and COI? Karen, do you want to take that one? Um, so I'm just going to get this. Um, well, as you're probably aware, there is quite a strong debate about um, disclosures of, of conflicts of interest in guidelines. And a lot of academics are now looking at the same disclosures that people make in different um, areas like grant panels and so on. Um, we've, we've also contributed to some of this research within NHMRC. There's clearly a lot of work to be done. I think there's, there's two parallel processes. One is that people are absolutely petrified of conflict of interest. And um, sometimes that can be counterproductive. But I think other, the other issue is that sometimes people compartmentalize their approach to conflict of interest, depending on whether it's a guideline or some other activity. Um, certainly things are getting better. Um, and I think the, the public gaze of uh, public consultation and the amount of documentation that NHMRC requires, it makes it easier for people to, um, to find problems. Um, certainly, the one guideline I alluded to before, which was an egregious breach of um, a conflict of interest process, to my, in my mind, that was probably the worst point that uh, NHMRC has, has got to with that. And I think things have definitely improved um, since then. And I would point you to the NHMRC's work on the dietary guidelines, and they've, um, they've almost expanded the, the um, boundaries of a conflict of interest declaration for this particular project. Um, and it's something that we'd be quite interested in getting people's views on uh, when we consult on the procedures and requirements later. So hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> okay, we might um, leave the questions there, but if anyone um, does have any other questions, um, please use the clinical guidelines at nhmrc.gov.au email. Um, and then just quickly, um, when the webinar closes, um, an evaluation will pop up. Um, please complete the evaluation. If you have time, it's just a quick few minutes. Um, and if you have any um, feedback um, specific to GIN, um, use the Australian New Zealand at gin.net uh, email. So thank you so much to Roz and Emily for being our fantastic special guests. And I hope that everyone has enjoyed um, the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye.